Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. Intersectionality is a fairly new term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. We're going to talk about intersectionality and inclusion on this episode with Andy Arias. To get this conversation started, I thought it would be a good idea to define intersectionality. The Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as, quote, the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. There are a lot of big words in that definition, and we're going to dive deep into intersectionality as we interview Andy Arias. But before we jump in, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. And I'd like to personally invite you to our private Facebook group, Crip Chat Club via Zoom, where we meet every Saturday to have disability community real talk. Also, if you like what you see here and you'd like to show us some love, please do that at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Andy, thanks so much for joining Chair Chats. I am super excited to have you. I know you and I spoke before this, and I let you know that I was kind of eyeing you out, fangirling a little bit, and I'm so glad you reached out to me and connected, and we're actually doing this. And honestly, I didn't know exactly what we're going to be talking about, so when we were going through what this episode would be about and you said intersectionality and inclusion I was like wow I haven't covered that topic yet so I'm excited to have it on here I defined intersectionality for our audience already so I would like to just dive in with you about this term and how it affects your your life on a daily basis with what you're doing, which are some amazing stuff. So I want to start off by having you tell us a little bit about your background and where your interest with intersectionality came from. Well, I don't really think I had a choice with intersectionality because I was born at five months. So I was born very early. I was born into systemic poverty. So I consider myself uh, Latinx and LGBTQ. And obviously I'm in a wheelchair, which maybe your audience can see or not, but I have CP. So I grew up um, I was born with all these intersections uh, that I had to deal with. So I really, it was part of who I was. And I knew that from a very early age, like this, like, I can't just be one person. I'm all these things. Um, the one thing that came later, I guess, is coming out, right? But everything else was already, hi, you're different. You're not like everyone else. And so how are you going to navigate that? So really, we always talk about rose-colored glasses, right? Like people see the world. I've always seen the world through intersectional glasses, right? Because that's who I am. So I look at people on many different levels um, to, to see their beauty, see their value, see what gifts they have. I, I'm one of those people that always see the good in all. And um, unless you piss me off, and then we're going to have an issue. But I try to see the good in all first. And so I think that that's where in my everyday intersectionality plays a big, huge part because I'm friends with many different types of people that have many different belief systems um, that people wouldn't think that I'm really good friends with, you know? They're like, 
but you're Andy, you're gay. How could you be friends with that person? Or Andy, you're you're disabled. How could you be friends with somebody who thinks like that? Because I see their value in one way or another. I see that they are trying to do something good because nobody ever thinks they're doing bad things, right? They're just trying to do better, which I, I like to see in people. It's so beautiful. I think you brought up so many good points in there. And it's just so interesting how he, as human beings, we want, we think that if we're a certain type of person, it negates our ability to be friends with another type of person. And that's mm-hmm. really interesting. And I love this topic because like you, um, for those of you who don't know, of course, I, I have the disability card, but you know, as a woman and someone who's biracial, who I'm, I'm half Filipino and half white, uh, and so, and first generation. So I, you know, I, I understand when we talk about disability, it's so interesting because I feel like people say, oh, well, you're just disabled and we're in one pot. And that's not always the case. Like, but people forget the diversity within the disability community. Mm. And so, yeah. 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 And I think Unfortunately, I think the disability community has a long way to go in terms of considering you and me as equal, right? I think that we look at everything, even the disabled individuals look through everything through a white lens, right? And they see, well, if it's good for me, it's obviously going to be good for anybody else because I'm, I'm the top, right? And it's, it's subconscious almost, right? Like everything we do, like media, it's the same thing. We see people with disabilities and they're usually white, right? We, we, we know that there's the sprinkle of color, but it sprinkles, right? It's not like a major theme and it's not consistent. It's like, okay, we had one person who was um, Asian American on a reality show. We're good. We had one African American. We're good, right? And it's not a consistent flow. So I think that we still have a lot of work to do around that. Well, I like sprinkles. So <laughs> I, I like being sprinkles. So yeah, <laughs> there is an equality. There is well, maybe not an inequality, but a lack of representation of people of color within the disability community. And I love the different, like I created One Leg Up Productions because I was just tired of waiting for permission. I'm like, wait, why am I waiting for permission to be represented, um, right. start representing myself? So you're doing a lot of cool things too. I want our audience to know about what you're up to so they can start keeping an eye and ear out for what it is. So let us know what you're doing right now. So I'm doing lots of things. Um, My day job is I work on federal policy for the federal government. But what I do on my off time, not my off time, because it's like three jobs. I'm a public speaker speaking on diversity and inclusion. And in the media, I'm producing two different films right now. Um, One is called uh, The Unicorn Closet, looking beyond... um, the hidden voices of the disability community. So it's, it talks about LGBTQ and disabled perspectives. Um, and that's just a short film, but we're looking to expand it to put it on streaming services. So good luck with that. Another big project I'm working on is called Danny's Twins. Um, I'm a producer for that film as well. And what I do is Um, It's about my friend Danny, who is a quad and who had twins during COVID, and she lives in Virginia. So she is dealing with sort of medical barriers and sort of this idea of people not accepting the fact that she's a mom, right? And you're a mom. And I, I just know that there are so many intersections of motherhood and disability out there, but there's still that stigma and perception that disabled people can't be parents. I, um, I try, I've been trying to adopt for two years. And one of the reasons I moved back to LA is because every agency was like, oh, but you're disabled. 
uh, how can you adopt, right? And adopting is sometimes harder than giving birth because it takes longer and you're scrutinized by the government. You know, um, not only am I disabled, but I'm gay. I like to say that I have gay face, right? So for your audience, hi, this is what gay face looks like. <laughs> um, but so it's a lot for people to absorb, you know, what do you, why do you want a kid? What's that? And then they hear my background growing up in foster care. And then there's all those levels of, of discrimination and sort of like bias of like my capabilities. So that's sort of, I, it, it's weird because it's work, but I try to live my work and enjoy my work. So it's all one to me, like everything I do is work, but it is my life. So it's, it's kind of like a flow of like who I am. That's awesome. I, w- I want to go back to intersectionality because yes. watching this right now who may identify with you, maybe they're in the foster care system, maybe um, they are also a, of a different ethnicity and, and they have, a, you know, they have a disability and you mentioned that you had to learn how to navigate in this world where you had all these different identities going on. What words of encouragement or advice would you give to someone who is maybe 10 steps behind you? No matter what or who is in your way, being your authentic self is the most powerful thing you can do, even if the world is going to tell you no. Uh, I learned very early to turn my no's into yeses. So if somebody told me, no, you don't fit here, I'd be like, well, yes, I do. and might not fit in your box, but I'm going to make a box of my own and I'm going to fit in my box or my, my very big square or circle or triangle or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's the key, the start of it is authenticness. Be your authentic self and people have no choice to eventually accept you. It's not gonna happen overnight, but being your authentic self, people people will start to see you, you know? And it's taken me a decade for people to start hearing my voice. Um, but before then, I was still here. I was still me. There was no, I didn't have a shift in me. People had a shift in their consciousness so they could see me and feel me. And like they were on the same frequency now where they were like, oh, wow, disabled people have um, different identities and they, they fall in different categories and, and they're sassy and they're bitchy and they're sweet and they're interesting and they're sexual and they're, they're human, right? Oh my God, concept, right? We're not like these other creatures that sometimes we feel like. So just be patient, but start with being your authentic self and, and that will kind of force others to start accepting who you are. That's so awesome. I was just speaking about authenticity today and it's almost that when you have the courage to really embrace who you are and be that in the world, you give people the space to also do that for themselves. Um, mm-hmm. and you're a great example of someone doing that and what that looks like and what opens up from that um, mm. when you're able to do do such a thing. So if anyone else is watching this right now and is like, oh, Andy, how did you do it? Just have the courage and and get to know who you are and be mm-hmm. okay with being that. So I think that's a beautiful lesson. Do you feel as someone with several cultural identities in one person, is there a specific identity that you identify with as your primary? It would be um, disability, gay, and then being Latino. So in that order, um, only because 
The other two, if I really, 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 really wanted to suppress them, I guess I could, you know. Um, but I can't hide my wheelchair. Where am I going to put it? I have no pocket big enough to, like, stash it away, right? So, you know, those dating profiles, and it always says, what's the first thing that people notice about you? Well, my 26-inch rims is a pretty, you know, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's kind of hard to miss. You know, I was horrible at hiding go seek. I couldn't fit anywhere. But so I think that that's like I own my disability, right? Which is something that people can be disabled and proud, fine. But I think I take it to another level with owning my disability. Like I don't go into a job interview or go into an audition or go into any space and think of my disability as a hindrance, I do, I flip it, right? I'm like, no, you need me and this is why. Because I bet you, you don't have a gay Latin disabled person all up in your company trying to make sprinkles and rainbows and butterflies and you need me. And you know what? People are like, holy shit, we do need him because now people are needing to be inclusive and and everything that they do if they want to stay relevant. In the definition of intersectionality that I read, it said, um, so I'm just going to read it to you. It said, the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Do you feel Mm. as a person with a disability who's also um, Latino and gay, do you feel like there's an extra layer of discrimination and disadvantage if you, as opposed to being just disabled? Yes. It's sort of like I'm always picking the hat, right? I'm, I never get to be, and this is, I've never had this before. So when I get there, it, it's, it, it'll be my Yoda, Yahoo, like, aha moment. Like, I'm always my authentic self wherever I go. But I never rolled into a space feeling like, I have to um, adjust the levels on my intersectional um, self. Like I, like when I'm in the disabled space, I feel like I have to talk about disabled issues. When I'm in an LGBTQ space, I have to kind of um, mitigate my my thinking on disability. And when I'm in a Latino space, I just don't talk about either of those things because. You know, I don't want to be prayed away. My my disability can't be prayed away. And my gayness, um, I'm, I'm best friends with the most attractive woman I've ever met. And if she can't get it done for me, nothing is going to, it's not going to, nothing is going to happen. So it's just, I've never felt fully accepted or embraced by, by any system, right? It's always been like, okay, we'll take you, but can you tone that down? Or can you be less than that right now? Um, And so I feel like uh, I, I, I always have to juggle. I'm always juggling, right? Like there's moments where I can be fully me, but they're like moments and even seconds and milliseconds, right? Cause some, I, my authenticness uh, no offense to people, but I think it scares some people. I think it 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 awakes something in them that's like too authentic for them to deal with. And then they're like, whoa, that's too real. You know, and so I think that it's okay, but I've never felt fully embraced or accepted in any system or space, which is unfortunate for now. What do you think needs to change in order for you to feel accepted? I'm going to confuse your audience a little bit. Sorry, audience. So I don't really need society to change for me. I want society to be authentically themselves, right? Because then I don't even think it'll be an issue, right? If people are being authentic 
all the way around, then I can go into a space and find acceptance and belonging wherever I'm at, right? I think we put up the world, society, put up these boxes to make themselves feel comfortable. I have no box. That's the problem. I've never been in a box. I People try to put me in a box. I'm like, oh no, but I love the sunshine. <laughs> and so I, I, I've, I've never had a box, right? And so like that scares people. Like I have no parameters and it freaks people out because they're like, they have no idea where I'm going to go. So I think like, when people start opening up to themselves, to the universe, I think that I'll, I'll be fine because I'm always fine. I just feel like to make them more comfortable and, and, less, and less awkward in that area, I, I always feel like I have to adjust my levels, right? And make them feel like, oh my God, is he going to be okay? Is he going to like, is he going to like, freak out on us because we're this person and he's that person but I never do um because of what I said before I value everyone for one thing or another like whoever they are yeah and you know it's really interesting because all these judgments are learned like we're not born coming out of our mom's womb with these judgments in our head they're all learned in some way that Mm -hmm. then creates these these boxes and these paradigms and you know all of the separation between people Mm -hmm. so for you and I, I I would agree with you in that authentic if everyone was just their authentic selves which is going back to who we truly are which is very much Mm -hmm. like how we are as children before Mm -hmm. we're polluted with thoughts of separation then we're able we'll be able to accept one another and we don't see like oh well andy is a latino gay disabled man right Right. so he's just andy yeah like i i always feel like andy and i think andy's um like i said freaks a lot of people out because they don't know where to put me. And I, 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 I said to myself in the universe when I was younger, it's like, it's okay. I can deal with me being this unicorn, which I like to label myself. It's like, I'm a unicorn. That's fine. Uh, you know, the human race, they're not really all about unicorns on every level. They're just like, that's cute but not right here or not right now, right? We can have that sometimes, but I'm a unicorn 24 seven. So that that tends to scare some people, but I'm, I'm okay with that, you know, cause eventually we'll all wake up and be like, well, we're all unicorns in one way or another. And we should all learn how to deal with one another and, and sort of, and we can disagree. And I'm cool with that. I just feel like disagreeing shouldn't lead to discrimination and and hate or um one person being valued over another which i think is what happens to the disabled community right definitely um how you mentioned that you think it scares people what is it Mm. do you think scares them it's it's going back to authenticity it's going back to the truth um I think I spoke with you yesterday and I said, I've always been a very spiritual person. And so no matter what, you know, religion said to me, like, oh, you can't be gay. Oh my God, we're going to pray your disability away. Oh my God, you can't love another man or you can't have kids. Like, like, that's not a real family. Like all those things I've heard. And I've known from my source that, this authenticity that I have in my heart is who I am. And I think that that's what freaks people out is because there are no, I have no agenda for anyone, right? Like in LA and in DC, it's very, people are thirsty. People are hungry. They want, they want what they want and they want to 
achieve things. And sometimes that comes at a cost of others. I'm not, I don't care. Like, that's not me. I know that I'm in my own lane. And I know that my lane is completely different from lane number two or three. And I think that that, that knowledge of knowing me and having that authentic voice, it freaks a lot of people out because they have that potential too, yet they keep it buried and they keep it hidden because they think they need to be something else uh, for one reason or another, work, life, um, all these other reasons that they put on themselves. They put these labels on themselves and it's really... It, it, I have the ability to like look beyond the labels and if I really know someone, I'm, it's easy, but I think I don't hide behind labels for others. So if I roll in, if you were to see me down the street, I'd be this person and you would probably be like, hell yeah, right? But even my friends say, what's what is not my best friend Angela doesn't care Angela loves this but a lot of my friends on the east coast say Andy can you just can you just tune it down a little bit do you have to like not in a bad way it's just they're not used to that level of realness right and I I can't shut it off I mean, I can if you pay me enough, I guess, if you're going to make me, <laughs> if you make, if I'm doing a movie and you need me to play it super serious, of course I'll do it. But, you know, I still get to be me at the end of the day. Yeah. Absolutely. And oh gosh, I wish everybody could do that. Don't you wish sometimes you could just like wave your hand and just swipe everybody's judgments clean and just be like, mm-hmm. hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, dating would be a lot easier. And um, yeah, just life would be so much easier. I didn't have to deal with other people's sort of worries and sort of frustrations on themselves, right? Nothing to do with me because it's all internal to themselves. But it does make that my disability isn't a challenge, but navigating their um perceptions is my challenge beyond my disability right so I could be disabled sure but navigating the minefield of somebody else's um negativity or someone's prejudice that's oh hell I don't know like that's crazy to me I'm like okay that's a daily struggle that Andy goes through but it's fine It is. I think you nailed it right on the head. It's not the actual disability. It's other people's stuff. And you're like, oh my Mm. gosh. Like, And it's hard because essentially we're not responsible for their stuff. We're just responsible for our own. Oh, right. We can't. uh, I can't control anyone. I learned that a long time ago. I cannot control anyone's emotions, thoughts, feelings, or even actions. I, my responses, sure, but can they be barriers? Yes, they can if it's a producer or a director or, you know, I've been passed up for many auditions um, for national commercials because I've been told that my lifestyle, right, which is like basically you're too gay, uh, my lifestyle is too much for viewers in Oklahoma so it's that kind of you know okay fine so I have to path my own way in in this media community and maybe it's the super gay way sure but it's it's just that's what's texting in my day-to-day is trying to deal with those like fake bullshit perceptions that other people have to put on themselves. What do you think is the biggest obstacle because of the intersectionality that is within you? I think the gay thing scares the people the most. I think like people can deal with the disability now. I think the Latino thing is okay. I mean, no offense to you or I, but like I get passed for 
um, ethnically ambiguous all the time, right? And I always have to say, no, but I'm Latinx, I promise. But I get called white all the time. And, you know, I just kind of like, that's their own thing. That's not my thing. But I think having all of this in a gay rapping is a lot for them. I think that they... First of all, it took a while for people to see anybody with a disability with a with a sexual desire and a sexual like identity. And then you add the gay to it and they're like, holy shit, you mean those people do what those other people do? How? You know, and I think it's as much as Abel's people's very barriers as it is for gay people i mean you look at gay media and it's not like they're embracing disability at all right like how many we've seen one character one one maybe one or two characters with a disability that have been gay in all the history of media hello it's 2020 i was hustling my ass out for the last 10 years in the industry and people were like no no you're too <laughs> I, I literally got no you're too gay at several auditions at several castings and and I was just like really so that's why I took off to DC people wonder why I left for four years because I don't like to be poor I've worked since I was 17 so hustling in the media industry where nobody wanted me really they were like you, you, we can't and even my agent was like I don't know what to do for you like you're talented sure but you're also gay and I don't know like I'm I'm really gay I'm not like straight plate um what do I call it? like my straight my gay friends that can pass for straight like again unless you pay me a ton of money the gay face doesn't go away, right? It's here. So I think that, that scares a lot of folks is that they, they're not used to all of this in a disabled body and a disabled presence. I, it, they, they can't handle it. Their brain just goes like, holy crap, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> How do you think we can raise awareness around intersectionality? People like to use intersectionality and inclusion, right? Sort of interchangeably and together as their sexy terms, right? Like, oh, we're inclusive. We believe in intersectionality. But if your business practice or your life or whatever you're doing does not include, let's just say, every color of the rainbow, right? If you don't practice what you preach in your business models or in your personal life, it's not going to go anywhere, right? It's going to remain a sexy term that people use to pretend that they're woke. But I think I live this life 24 seven. And all I'm asking people to do is, you know, consider different hiring practices, consider casting different types of folks, consider being friends with different types of people, um, even the people that you don't agree with, because it's easy to be friends with people that you agree with. Shit, it's great. But, you know, I learn more from people that I don't agree with. I learn more about myself. I learn more about them. I learn how to navigate the world better. So just start practicing it in whatever way you can. We all have the capacity to sort of grow or stretch ourselves are we choosing to do that that's the big question right um don't rely on some big movement right we know that black lives matter is happening we know all these things are happening but what are you doing within yourself and not you i'm not pointing at you i'm pointing at your audience um what are you doing within yourself to make sure that you're doing it right that you are the change it's kind of cliche, but that you want to see in the world and not waiting for some big movement to happen for that to be. Can we make that a little bit more tangible? For for example, what could someone do to help um, raise intersectionality 
awareness or to be more intersectional? Let's say you have a panel, right? Let's say you want to have a discussion about all different types of topics. Let's just pick one. Let's pick disability and parenthood, right? So first off, I would have a panel of all different kinds of mothers from all different kinds of backgrounds. And you, I would have a African-American mom. I would have a white mom. I would have um, all kinds of mothers from different backgrounds, different economic backgrounds too, right? Because there's a class system in the disability world where you're either on benefits or you're not, right? And I think that if you're not on benefits, people think they're better sometimes because they have more influence and affluence, right? But we're all the same, right? And for the grace of goodness, we could be there too. So I think that people need to, when they're thinking of being inclusive and having a panel or having a discussion, inviting all perspectives to the table, not just the perspectives that are going to give them the answers that they want, because that's easy and a little boring, right? Like, I want to have like a perspective where people are like, shit, I don't agree with that person, but that's a very interesting point you just said. Maybe I need to dive into that a little bit and figure that out for myself. Well, and everything's better with sprinkles, right? I love sprinkles. Sprinkles and glitter are everything that I'm about. So awesome. Me too. Me too. Well, and I know I'm not saying this in, um, I'm not saying this to flatter you, but you're using the word intersectionality. And I think you are woke. I think the point you made about are we associating and allowing us ourselves to be exposed to people who have differing perspectives and opinions and allowing them to be where they're at and appreciating them anyway, even if it not necessarily aligns with your own opinions and thoughts. Amen. Yeah. 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 I, I, it's not a popular opinion, um, but I, I really believe that that's how we're going to make change is by aligning ourselves and sort of compromising and thinking about other viewpoints before we're like, that person's wrong and I'm right, because we're not going to get anywhere in that space. Exactly. So the sprinkler, the sprinkles are ushering the next evolution of the human yeah. consciousness. So <laughs> yes, I love it. We're going to put that on a t-shirt somewhere. Sprinkles. I see it now. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Andy. I so appreciate you being here on Chair Chats and sharing us your perspective. I'm so glad that we got to have this conversation and you brought it to the forefront. So thank you for your courage with that. Thank you for being authentically you so that other people can also be authentically them. And I would love for you, the viewer, if you're watching this, I would love for you to engage with us. Put in the comments what your intersectionality is. And mm -hmm. for Andy and I, we have different ethnicities and cultural backgrounds. We have different genders and, and different sexual preferences. We have different disabilities. So there's intersectionality and there's such beauty in us. I almost like see us as like prisms, right? Like we're just, right? We're just reflecting different lights through one mm. object, which is us. So yeah. I want you to share what your intersectionality is. And if you don't have it in the way that Andy and I have it, but there are so many identities within you. Maybe you're yeah. a woman and a mom and an entrepreneur, or maybe you're a man and a father and a son and an uncle. Like there's so many beautiful different types of intersectionalities it doesn't always have to look in the traditional sense of intersectionality mm -hmm. that Andy and I meet so share with us your beauty I'd love to know I also want to remind you to please subscribe and share and I'd like for you to check out our private Facebook group called Crip Chat Club via Zoom. And if you like what you see on, up one, on one Leg Up Productions and you want to show us some love, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you so much. And until we meet again, be blessed. Bye.